So is this working? Okay. Let me just uh, put the time to run here. Okay, so first of all, thanks to the organizers for um, inviting me and allowing me to speak to you guys about my work. So many people don't know where Uberlândia is, um, so let me show you. It's near the center of Brazil. Of course, there's a lot of Brazil here, but uh, technically most of people live around this region, so it's, uh, I would say it's the, the center of, uh, of Brazil, more or less, in the state of Minas Gerais. And to do some marketing of the city and uh, our institute, let me show you some pictures because you probably nobody knows about this place here. So here's some pictures of the city. My building is actually on the next street where I live. Uh, some top view. Uh, we have a soccer stadium, of course. A nice lake where you can go for a jog. There's a five kilometers uh, perimeter here. It's a big, uh, big park. Very nice place for the weekends. And this, this is a closer look of this lake here. So we can have barbecue, we can have uh, picnics here. It's a nice place to live. Uh, this is some pictures of the university. This is not the physics building. I couldn't find a picture of the physics building online. I should take one myself eventually. But it's a beautiful place. Some of the students here were there. Uh, Flavia is not here now, but she's working here in, in Natal now. And she's, she, was, she, she was a student there in Uberlandia as well. But we are mostly famous for this. Uh, Minas Gerais is famous for having the best cheese, the best food, the best beer, and the best cachaça. This particular one is interesting because it's our Johnny Walker. This is the literal translation of Johnny Walker, so it's a funny one. <laughs> and you can see the logo exactly the same <laughs> as Johnny Walker as well. Uh, okay, so we do physics there as well. If you want to know more about the city, we can talk later. Um, so I'm going to talk about this work, which doesn't really fit exactly in the content of this uh, uh, conference. But I chose to talk about this because it, this was fully developed in Uberlandia with the group of Tomás Schmidt, which is the DFT guy over there, me and two of his students. Ernesto now is a professor in the south of Brazil. But I like to talk about this because, well, because uh, it's, uh, it was fully developed in Uberlandia. So it's about uh, topological protection in non-symorphic ribbons out of a uh, symorphic bulk. So in the main message that I want to give you guys here is that boundaries matter, and they matter a lot. So I'm going to go through some uh, group theory calculations to extract effective models for topological insulators, uh, which are not exactly, exactly new, but uh, many people don't know how to obtain these effective models, so I'm going to give an introduction about that. And then I'm going to show you that once you cut your uh, monolayer into ribbons, you break some symmetries, and depending on how you break these symmetries, you get different... Uh, uh, details, different uh, band structures for the topological ad states. This is not essentially new. We all know that boundaries matter from graphene. You have zigzag and armchair, but somehow in this field of topological insulator, I have the feeling that everybody forgets that boundary matters a lot, especially if you have, if you're talking about an edge state that lives on the boundaries. So let's see how the boundaries play a role here. Um, so of course, I will not talk about this. We all know what topological insulators are. You have the BHZ model, Mollenkamp's experiments, a bunch of ARPS measurements. These are completed, completely outdated. There's, of course, tons of other papers that I could uh, put here. And you have uh, the topological crystalline insulators, which you will be the main part of my talk. Uh, these were developed mostly initially by Liang Fu um, and collaborators. Uh, the main difference is that the direct cones live not at the gamma point, but they live at the X point at the border of the Brillouin zone, and they're protected by crystal symmetry rather than uh, time reversal symmetry. So how does this work? So I want to give a simple example to just show you guys how you can get topological protection without time reversal symmetry. So I'm going to use the C2V uh, group to show that. So this is a picture of my PBSE monolayer. I'm going to consider that it's going to be infinite along X and semi-infinite along Y. So here's the edge top part here will be the edge. So the group that describes, the point group that describes this lattice is the C2V. You have a rotation, pi rotation along Y, you have a mirror along X, and you have a mirror along uh, Z. Okay? So it's a, an abelian group. That means it's boring. So abelian groups are boring. There's not much we can do uh, here. But if you add spin, then the spin will play a, a crucial role here for us. What happens is that once you add spin, you have to go for the SU2 representation of the D1 half uh, uh, hap of your, C of your C2V double group. And the matrix representation for these operators, of course, is the identity. I will ignore it. Uh, 
the matrix representation for these are given by these generators, and the mirror uh, x and mirror z has the minus sign because of the inversion. Uh, so these are the, the one d one half uh, irreducible representation of the double group. And why is spin matters? Because it matters because now the group is non-abelian. What we have is this, okay, of course, everybody commutes with the Hamiltonian. That's the definition of the group. Um, they have some cyclic permutations among them, among these group operations. But most importantly, they anti-commute with itself, with themselves. So it's non-abelian, and it has this anti-commutation rule. And this is what uh, gives this an interesting uh, uh, physics. So how does this play a role? I'll show here a simple, uh, a simple explanation of why these uh, guys matter. I have a better slide showing this, but since the time is short, I, I, I'll choose the simplest one. So I'm going to use the eigenvalues of mirror z to label my states. I can choose, uh, I could choose mx or c2y, but I, I'm choosing mz, is the, the, the typical choice, to label the state. So for a given kx, I have a state here with some energy E, and I'll label this uh, eigenstate by the mirror Z eigenvalue, which is uh, plus Y, plus I, at a given Kx. Now, if I apply the MX operation, mirror X operation here, I'm going to go from plus Kx to minus Kx, but since mirror X and mirror Z anti-commutes, it's easy to show that uh, th through this process, you actually flip the sign of the mirror operator as well. So the eigenstate that you get applying mirror x to e plus y is an eigenstate that generates with this one, but uh, with a mirror eigenvalue minus y. That means that these states are always different. It doesn't matter which kx I choose. If I go down in kx, approaching kx equals 0, these states will cross. And here at the crossing, you have uh, a degeneracy. Notice that if the eigenvalues of mirror z would, be, would, this, would uh, be the same, then you could have here not a degeneracy, but you could have a single point. Here. It could be that these states are the same at kx equals 0. But since they have opposite values for the mirror operator, they must be different states. So they must be, uh, there must be a degeneracy at kx equals 0. So here you have a topological protection because you cannot open this gap unless you break uh, the mirror z or the mirror x or the C2y. Uh, Technically, here you only need a mirror x and mirror z. Uh, you don't need time reversal. Time reversal would do the same thing as mirror x is already doing to the system. Okay, so it's a topological protection without uh, without uh, uh, time reversal symmetry. Now, that this is nice. It's a nice way to see how this works. But technically, to actually find the effective Hamiltonians, it's better to use the method of invariance. So I want to give you an introduction about that as well. Um, so the idea here is I want to expand my Hamiltonian in powers of kx, or ky, or whatever. Here I'm going to use kx only to make a connection with the previous slide. Uh, so then I have this h0, h1, and h2, which are unknown mat matris matrices. And the goal is to find these unknown matrices using symmetry. So what we want is that uh, the total Hamiltonian must commute with all the operators in the C2V, and these are the operators, just to, to remind you, in the double group. Um, so how do we do this? OK, so we're going to do, do term by term here. So starting with H0, we want H0 to commute with C2I, to commute with mirror X, and to commute with mirror Z. But if you pay attention, C2I is sigma Y, mirror X is sigma X, uh, mirror z is sigma z. So the only possible matrix that commutes with all Pauli matrices is the diagonal matrix. So this is easy. This one is easy. So just a diagonal matrix, uh, identity matrix times a constant that you can call E0. For the second term, things get a bit more interesting. So you have an unknown matrix, matrix and kx. And we want this product to commute with, uh, with mirror x, for instance. But mirror x flips the sign of kx. So instead of uh, requiring that these two commute, I can simply require that age one anti-commutes with mirror x. The sign is changed because the sign of, of kx changes through M mx. Uh, the same thing happens for C2i. C2i also changes the sign of uh, kx. So I want age one to anti-commute with C2i. And mirror z, mirror z does not uh, change the sign of kx. So we want age one to commute with uh, with mirror z. 
So to solve all these equations together, the only possible choice is for age one to be some constant times uh, sigma z, the only choice. So up to linear order, then we can do the same for age two, age three, and so on. So up to linear order, we have that the Hamiltonian is some constant times the density matrix and uh, some linear term, uh, which is already diagonal. And that's great, because now we reproduce exactly the same picture we had before. Okay? So this is the method of invariance. It's just uh, trying to apply the, the, the symmetry operations requiring that the total Hamiltonian or term by term uh, commutes with all your symmetry operations. Um, this is a very simple case because I'm, on, I, I'm only using the d one half repre the spin representation of the double group. Now, if I want to do the same thing for the PBSE monolayer, the complete monolayer, not just the edge states, which is more interesting, uh, I cannot look only for the spin. I have to look at the orbital components as well. So the idea is how uh, now I'm going to try to obtain an effective model for the X point in the Brillouin zone of the PBSE monolayer. Um, I have here a bunch of coordinates. I have x and y, x prime and y prime. This will make sense later. For now, focus on x and y. Um, so from the DFT calculations, I know that the top of the valence band is given by pz orbitals of pb that I will, I will represent like this. And once you put this on the lattice, you can see here that the pb atoms are on the corner of the unit cell. So I put the pz orbitals over there. And you can see there's a sign change here. And the, si the, the sign between this PZ orbit and this one changes because I'm working on the X point of the Brillouin zone. So I have to account for the block phase once I translate uh, one lattice, one unit lattice. And the bottom of conduction band is given by PX orbital, which is simpler. It's just uh, one PX at the center of the unit cell, like that. So I can construct my basis using these two orbitals times the spin, of course. So I have a four, by, uh, a four component uh, spinner here to, to work. And this gives me a four by four representation of the D2H D2 group, which is the group of the X point here. Uh, I will not go through the details of the calculation, but applying the same method of the invariance, but now with a four by four representation of the matrices, I get this Hamiltonian for the bulk. For the bulk by bulk, I mean the monolayer, the full monolayer. So it has a gap term here, delta, which is the one that changes sign once you go from the topological to the trivial regimes. You have some linear terms, sigma x couples to the spin, tau couples to the orbitals, these two orbitals. And then you have some quadratic corrections here, but the most important physics, of course, in the linear terms. So here's how the effective model uh, shows up in the band structure, so E energy as a function of k. Here in the trivial regime with a positive delta, and here in the topological regime with a negative delta, the arrows are the spin texture of the band structure. And here's the DFT calculation from uh, our DFT group as a function of the spin orbit. So you can see here that the positive delta matches uh, zero spin orbit, and the uh, negative delta matches neg uh, full spin orbit calculation. OK, so this is bulk. Bulk is easy. Now what we want to show, well, what I want to show you is what happens when you confine, when you break the symmetry. So I'm going to confine first. There's five different types of uh, ribbons that we can get. In, in graphene, you have zigzag and arm chair. Here they have five types, five different cuts that leads to five different broken symmetries. Um, so first, I'm going to confine along y. This means that I'm going to project the y string, the y point here, into gamma bar of the kx, the, quantized, uh, the linear model kx. And I'm going to project the x into the x bar. The M point and the gamma point I can neglect because they have huge gaps that won't contribute. So I can focus only on the X point and the Y point. And I show you the bulk, um, the bulk Hamiltonian for the X point. If I want the bulk Hamiltonian for the Y point, I can just apply a C4 rotation and I get there. They're connected by a C4 rotation. So since I know the X, I know, I know the, the Y as well. So the first ribbon that I can, I can think of is this one. So I'm basically cutting the, the PBSE monolayer at the, the, the PB atoms. So I would have here another layer of uh, SE and PB. So one but I'm cutting here. So this edge ends with uh, PB atoms, and this edge also ends with PB atoms. It turns out that the symmetry of this ribbon is the same symmetry as the full Hamiltonian, the, the two edge. That means that the Hamiltonian for the ribbon A is simply the same as the monolayer Hamiltonian, HX. So HX is the monolayer, the full monolayer Hamiltonian. If instead I cut at the black atoms, at the, the SE, SE atoms, 
Well, nothing changes actually. I still have the same symmetry and the Hamiltonian for the B ribbon is the same Hamiltonian as the, the bulk. So this is still boring. Um, for ribbon C, things change a bit. It on the top edge, we have uh, P B, uh, uh, SE atoms, and the lower edge, we have uh, PB atoms. So this is different. The symmetry is now different. The so C2V is a lower symmetry. But it turns out that all the extra terms that you get from breaking this symmetry are just fine-tuning. So we can assume for now that uh, the Hamiltonian for the C ribbon is the same as the bulk Hamiltonian, or approximately the same as the bulk Hamiltonian. So basically, although I'm breaking symmetries, I'm, I'm changing the, 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 the edges here, the Hamiltonian for these three ribbons are the same, so they are not distinguished by, by broken symmetries per se, uh, in, in the sense of the Hamiltonian itself. Instead, they are different due to boundary conditions. So as I said, boundary matter. Um, what happens here is, let, let's say, let, let's focus on A for now. Um, so how do I apply a boundary condition here, thinking about this uh, four-component spinner? So prior to cutting, set up before cutting the, the, the edge here, so you can see I'm, I'm putting back some layers here. Before cutting the edge here, I would have a layer of um, a black dots here and a layer of uh, white ones here, so, uh, selenium and, and, and PB here. So what I do is, instead of setting the wave function to zero at the edge, I set the wave function to zero at different points accordingly to the termination of the edge. So at, at, the, the, at this line, which is the uh, y equal w plus a over 2, uh, I set the zero for the lower components of the spinner. So the, this go to zero at this point, while the top components of the spinner must go to zero at the next line, which is the line that I'm cutting. This is similar to what is done in graphene. Actually, in graphene, uh, uh, Bray and Fertig uh, actually do similar, uh, similar boundary, boundary conditions to distinguish between armchair and, and, and zigzag. Uh, okay, so this is what I do for ribbon A. And for ribbon B, I'll do exactly the opposite because now the termination here is a black dot. So the next line is the white ones and then the black again. So I reverse. Now uh, I set to zero. Um, the PB, the top component of the spinner, at W plus of A over 2, and I set to zero the black, the, the SE atoms, at W plus A, uh, on top and the bottom. And this leads to different band structures. Here we have the DFT model, and here the effective model band structures. As you can see, uh, in one case, for ribbon A, the Dirac cone is at positive energy, while the, uh, for ribbon B, the Dirac cone is, is at uh, 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 negative energy. And this is quite interesting to me, at least. Uh, I like, uh, if you like, band structure calculations, because the only difference between these two is the boundary condition. The Hamiltonian, is the parameters are exactly the same. The only thing that it is changing is the boundary condition, okay, which is motivated by the crystal structure. Uh, and this is the generate. I always forget to say this, so I put this here. Um, this is just this is the, the the colors here represent the mirror Z operator plus or minus y on one edge of the sample. And these are degenerate with the other edge of the sample to symmetry. So it's uh, two times degenerate. Uh, ev every line here is two times degenerate. Now if you go to the, to the C ribbon, as you can see, this, the top of the C ribbon matches the top of the B ribbon, and the bottom of the C ribbon matches the bottom of the A ribbon. So I apply mixed boundary conditions. On the top here, I apply the same boundary conditions that I was applying in B, and on the bottom, I apply the same boundary conditions that I was applying in A. And what I get, I get a mixture of both. I get one direct cone on top and one direct cone on bottom. Okay, so basically the, the, the degeneracy here is broken and one of them is lifted. This this has the same effect as applying an electric field, because the electric field would break the, the inversion symmetry and uh, would split the cones. But here I can split them without applying any field. It's just uh, manipulating the boundaries. Now, besides these three ribbons, I have ribbons D and E, which are also very interesting. Um, now I'm confining along uh, the y prime direction, so I'm rotating the whole sample. That's why I have here. So instead of projecting into this kx uh, axis, I'm going to project on the kx prime. So now both x and y, uh, time reversal invariant moment, uh, are projected into this x prime. So I have to expand my basis. Instead of working with simply the uh, psi x, 
I have to now work with Psi X and Psi Y, which is ju just a C4 rotation over Psi X, and I get an 8x8 eight eight Hamiltonian. And interesting, the difference, now if, if you pay attention for the boundaries here, you have black and white dots here, you have black white dots here, so the boundaries are not different anymore. So the difference between ribbons D and E now is truly the symmetry. And it turns out that the main difference is on the valley, into the XY valley couplings. So the, the diagonal Hamiltonian is just the bulk Hamiltonian rotated to this basis. Uh, they are exactly the same as the bulk Hamiltonian, but the, the different symmetries lead to, to different couplings. Particularly, ribbon E is non-symorphic. So the original bulk is symorphic. You can apply any point group symmetry and you get your, your, your total group. But here, for instance, I just, uh, I'll just show one. If you, if you apply a mirror Y operation, this white dot goes to the black one, so it's not a symmetry. But if you apply the mirror operation plus half a translation, which is the A over 2 translation, you get a symmetry. So the non-symorphic symmetries are, are, are point group symmetries uh, plus fractional translations of the unit cell, non-trivial translations of the unit cell. Right? So this is a non-symorphic. And non-symorphism is always interesting because it closes gaps. Every time you have a non-symorphic symmetry in comparison with a symorphic one, a gap closes. So the point is, which gap is closing here? Um, OK, so then I, I go for the, for the model, and I find the, the, the xy valley coupling for these materials. So for the ribbon D, I get this expression. You don't have to care much about the expression. Just remember they are different from the other case. And I get this band structure for the ribbon D. And you see here, there's a gap here, both in the model and in the DFT calculation. Now if I go for the ribbon E, the valley, the valley coupling is different, and the gap closes. So this, is, this gap is, is, is protected uh, due to this non-symorphic symmetry. And this is quite interesting, because this gap remains closed, even if the wave functions overlap. So typically, you say that the gap of topological insulator is protected against uh, 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 time reversal symmetry, well, due to time reversal symmetry. But uh, if you make your time topological insulator very thin, the wave functions overlap, hybridize, and opens a gap, right? But if you have a non-symorphic system, basically there is this shift due to the fractional translation of your lattice. And that means that even if the wave functions overlap, they don't hybridize. So this this crossing here is robust even if the wave functions hybridize, even, even if they overlap, even for a very small system. That's why this remains closed, and then this opens first. OK, so gap, the gap at x closes for arbitrary ribbon each. This is the generate. So again, this is the colors for one edge, and you have the same for the other edge. OK, so uh, the main message here is that, that um, boundaries matter. So just by, so in, in all this, um, cases here, for ribbons A, B, C, D, and E, the parameters are exactly the same. So the bulk Hamiltonian is exactly the same. The only thing that is changing from one to the other is the, the boundary conditions and the broken symmetries that you get when you, when you cut the, the topological insulator. Uh, so the idea here of, the, of this uh, topological crystalline insulator is exactly that uh, in comparison with a usual topological insulator, you can have more handles. You can manipulate the band structure better than you can in the traditional topological insulators. This is just an example. If you do some uh, uh, boundary engineering here, you apply different fields, you apply some impurities there, you can manipulate how these boundaries work. And this is all on the X point. For instance, for this C ribbon, you also have uh, two direct cones at the gamma point. But they respond to perturbations differently. So maybe you can find a way. We don't do this in this paper, but uh, maybe you can find a way to open the gap at the gamma point while keeping the, the linear bands at the X point, and you get a strong topological insulator out of. So there are many possibilities that you can do here. You can uh, apply different uh, uh, substrates and so on, trying to manipulate these gaps better than you can in, in traditional uh, topological insulators. So uh, besides this work, I want to quickly, I still have five minutes left, I want to go quickly through some other projects that I have. So the first that I to advertise is I, I'm writing a book on introduction of computational physics using the Julia book. It's already in the Julia website on the on the uh, uh, on the language website. It's there. This is uh, Julia. Julia is like, uh, in my opinion, um, extension uh, improvement over Python. 
Python is nice, but Julia is more efficient, and uh, it was developed for computational physics. Python is too general. This is more specific for us. So it's a nice language to learn, especially the students. Uh, so that's why it's an introduction. If you need high performance, you go to C or Fortran. But uh, if you want to solve simple equations, Julia is quite nice. Uh, for the Brazilians, I guess Brazilian, all the Brazilians here know, I developed this extension for the Chrome, Firefox, and Safari to bypass the CAPIS portal de periodicos. I'm not sure if the foreigners here had any trouble downloading papers, but we Brazilians now have trouble downloading papers since CAPIS changed the way we access the, the, the journals. So I found a way to bypass their system legally. I'm not doing anything illegal here. It's not Sci-Hub or anything like that. Um, but makes our life much easier. Actually makes our life as easier as it was before CAPIS changed its stuff. So I, I basically put it back as, well as it was. And I have now 15,000 users all over the country, as you can see here in this map. This is an estimate, of course. Um, and I'm doing some Android projects, but this is under development. This is for uh, teaching uh, purposes. Uh, it's going to be online uh, next year, I guess. It's going to be nice. I'm, I'm doing this to learn Android. I'm, I'm learning how to, to code in Android as well. As I can see, I like computational physics. Um, and some other works quickly. So I'm working with uh, some experimental groups on spin drift and diffusion. I will not talk much about this. This, is, this was developed with uh, Felix Hernandez, a professor in Sao Paulo, USP, and the group of uh, Gian Salis at IBM Zurich. So they, do th they do did the measurements of the persistent spin helix dynamics uh, with uh, drift field. And what we find is that uh, uh, the frequency of this procession scales linearly with uh, the cubic Dressel-Haus terms and linearly with the drift velocity. So this allows us to measure omega as a function of the drift velocity and extract the Dressel house directly from this measurement. It was quite a nice, uh, nice result, so I, I was helping them with the theory, of course. Um, then we wrote a theory paper on the same subject, uh, comparing sing uh, single subband and two subband uh, spin drift and diffusion dynamics using a phenomenological random walk model, which is um, uh, quite nice to, to incorporate new effects easily. So we compare, if you, uh, we apply the drift parallel and anti-parallel to the persistent spin helix pattern, and we get different behaviors once you have these two conditions. We include the magnetic field with drift. This is new. So this is just a basically a review of what's in the literature. And this is actually new. We had uh, papers discussing magnetic field. We had papers discussing drift. And we find that there are corrections once you have they put together. They can be important. And for the two subbands case, this is a phenomenological model, so I, I'm trying to, to understand two extreme regimes of weak and strong inter band scattering. So if I have weak scattering, this is the pattern that I get. This is very similar to what Carlos actually found uh, quite recently as well. This is a topological pattern on the persistent spin helix once you have two subbands. These are basically two or orthogonal persistent spin helix together. But in the same system, for the same parameters, if this inter band scattering is strong, Instead of having these crossed parameters, you have more like a basal parameter, which is distorted by the drift velocity. So we discussed these two possibilities. And it turns out that in the experiments, um, it's more likely to have the, the strong interstellar band scattering because this requires fine tuning. And so Felix and Vanessa C, they did this experiment and uh, they measured the, the, the spin orbit interaction as a function of the electric field, or orthogonal, the, the, the Rashba electric field. And the dashed line here is the fit from, from my theory. And so it's a nice fit, except for some oscillations that we, uh, could be limitations of the measurement, simply. And especially here in this paper, we find that the Rashba constant scales uh, quite large with uh, the electric field. So typical uh, numbers for this scaling of the Rashba field with uh, the electric field is 10 EA square. And we find 30 35. So for this two subband system, apparently for some reason that I don't understand yet, this value is quite high. Um, and I'm doing some works with uh, Carlos Eggs with the Titebevegun in topological insulators to show how the how a wave packet bounces on the edges and what is the edge co edge state contribution to these dynamics. And it turns out that there is basically no contribution from the edge state dynamics if your initial packet is in the bulk. And we calculate the Landau's energy tunneling for this system, which we show here, but I'll not discuss in details because I'm basically out of time. Uh, and with, uh, again, 
everybody from Uberlandia, we are working with confinement topological insulators using the linear Hamiltonian, which suffers from the fermion doubling problem. And we are talking about this because we found uh, a nice solution for the fermion doubling problem, which is already known as the Wilson mass. But the Wilson mass solution for the fermion doubling problem usually tells you there is a broken symmetry. Once you put the Wilson mass, you break a symmetry. And what we say here is that if you are working with condensed matter physics, there is always confinement. And the confinement saves you from this broken symmetry. So it's while in, in, in QCD, there is this no-go theorem that you cannot solve the fermion doubling problem without breaking a symmetry. In topological insulators, in condensed matter, this is not uh, a problem. Confinement saves us. So this is going to be online uh, soon as well. And this is work I did with uh, Luis, Caio, and Sergio Loa, and Edson Werneck from Uberlandia, uh, where we study the transport, uh, condo transport across this system. And in order to do this, we had to generalize the meyer wingring proportional coupling into an effective model. Uh, so this goes beyond the proportional coupling approximation, which is also a very interesting result. It's on the archive now. And it's some extension of the current work. I'll skip this. And uh, give me just one minute, because we have uh, positions in Uberland that I need to announce. So we have actually a full professor position, which is the highest rank in our university, in the Federal Universities in Brazil, of a monthly salary uh, of 50,000 reais. Um, for foreigners, Brazilians, if you're interested, uh, come talk to me, please. We are looking for applicants now. But the application, the, the exam is a bit uh, lengthy in Brazil. It's a pain because it's a public process. So you have to pass to a written exam to get a job, <laughs> which is weird. Uh, and have to show a long-term project, a few, like eight years or something. And uh, you have to defend your CV, or we call it memorial, but it's basically going to show what you did to the, to the university. And we have a visiting professor, which is easier. The salary goes from nine to 15,000, depends on your CV. For Brazilians, the visiting professor can last up to two years. For foreigners, it can last up to 40 years. And to apply, this is not confirmed yet, but uh, the idea is to have uh, uh, applicants sending only the CV, nothing else. So a simpler process, hopefully. If you are interested in any of these two things, come talk to me or send me an email. Eventually, once uh, we are still finishing the, 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 the process here to put this on the web page, but eventually it's going to be the web page. But you can talk to me at any time about this as well. So I'd like to thank my group and the organizers for, for, the, for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you, Jerson, for a very nice overview. Of